Hi, everyone, and welcome to this video from the Texas Commission on the Arts. We've created this series of videos to help students and teachers prepare for the Poetry Out Loud competition. My name is Derek Mudd, and I'm a program administrator at the Texas Commission on the Arts, or TCA. TCA is the state agency for arts in Texas, and we conduct the state Poetry Out Loud competition that feeds into the national competition. Today's session is called Embodying a Poem, and our presenter is Carrie Fountain. Carrie Fountain's poems have appeared in Poetry Magazine, American Poetry Review, and The New Yorker, among many others. Her first collection, Burn Lake, was a National Poetry Series winner. Her second collection, Instant Winner, was published by Penguin Random House in 2014. Fountain's debut novel for young adults, I'm Not Missing, was published in 2018 by Flatiron Books. And her first children's book, The Poem Forest, about the life and legacy of poet and ecologist W.S. Merwin, is forthcoming from Candlewick Press. Her newest poetry collection, The Life, was just published by Penguin Random House. In 2019, she was named Poet Laureate of the state of Texas. Carrie, thank you so much for being here today. It's so. wonderful to be here. Um, and it's wonderful to um, be asked as a poet who really does love reading poetry to kind of walk through how I would approach a poem, especially thinking of it as um, a poem that I would be performing as you do in Poetry Out Loud. Um, because reading poetry and reciting poetry, I think that some people might think it's more like acting than like reading, but it's much more like reading than like acting. Um, and I think the one of the ways to make your recitation of a poem as full as possible is by kind of having a very clear sense of what the poem is doing kind of like in your body, you know, when you're when you're saying it out loud. Um, so I with that in mind, um, I thought I would walk you through uh, reading this poem, I'm going to share my screen with you. And we're going to look at this very short poem by the poet. William Carlos Williams. Okay, let me see here. Let me get that nice and big on the screen. Um, a poem called Perfection. And you'll see it's a short poem. I, you know, I would even look at that poem and say, are those, are those exclamation points? You know? And I'd say, okay, I'd, I'd like to put that in my mind even before I read past the title. And I would stay with the title for a second and say perfection, okay. And think about what my expectations um, about a poem called perfection might be. And I would also note that perfection um, is a tremendous abstraction. Um, when you say the word perfection, like when you say the word love, or when you say the word um, God, or you say the word um, uh, nature. Nature is a little bit trickier because we have so many visual ideas of what nature, what that means, what we mean by nature. But when we say um, abstractions out loud, nothing comes to our mind's eye. It kind of like, I see the word perfection. It's almost like hanging out in space, right? Like just the word. And I might, because our minds are busy meaning making machines and they're doing things all the time when we're reading, I might translate perfection into an image in my mind. Um, you know, I think of, I don't know why, but I'm thinking of like a little chocolate cake, one of like one of those cakes that just doesn't even look real. Um, something that is just perfect, flawless. Um, so all of that's happening just in the title of this poem, Perfection. Now, I think I would start by simply reading through the poem for orientation, rather than saying, I'm gonna read through it for meaning. I'm gonna find out what this poem means. I find it more useful to think about, I'm gonna enter this poem for the first time 
like walking into a dark room, right? And and I want to look around and you know feel like, oh, now I'm starting to make out shapes, right? Because it's a much more generous way of entering a poem, both on the part of how you approach the poet's work, but also as a reader, because you don't have that pressure on you to uh, make meaning out of the poem, right? Um, this, no this notion, this myth that every poem means something and the job of reading a poem is to understand what it means and maybe even be able to answer questions about it on a test. To me, the reason for poetry, the reason for reading a poem is for the experience of reading the poem. And with that experience often comes tremendously deep meanings, tremendous emotional meanings, tremendous emotional reactions um, in, inside the body. But I feel like entering a poem and just kind of looking around rather than saying, oh God, I don't know what it means. I don't know what it means. Or, oh, now I know what it means. So I'm not gonna go beyond that. This is what it means, bum, bum, bum. Um, it's, it's much more generous a way of starting. So I'm going to read through the poem once simply to orient myself in the poem. Perfection. Oh, lovely apple, beautifully and completely rotten. Hardly a contour marred, perhaps a little shriveled at the top, but that aside, perfect in every detail. Oh, lovely apple, what a deep and suffusing brown mantles that unspoiled surface. No one has moved you since I placed you on the porch rail a month ago to ripen. So my first, right, my first reaction when sort of orienting myself in the poem is to notice the way that the punctuation is really giving us some direction on um, how to read the poem. And I would even say that those O's, oh, lovely apple, oh, lovely apple, um, also give us a sense of, um, direction in terms of reading the poem. And then in terms of like the narrative of the poem, what happens in the poem, um, I'm really drawn to that last sentence, that very clear last sentence. No one has moved you since I placed you on the porch rail a month ago to ripen. And of course, the line breaks in the poem are giving us a lot of, of um, information and signal as well. But that last sentence is so surprising. After these, oh, lovely apple, uh, you know, not a beautifully and completely rotten. Um, all these sort of, um, I think, I think from my orientation reading that those declarations with exclamation marks of, oh, lovely apple. I think that they are truly um, odic, like an ode to this apple. I believe that William Carlos Williams, the poet, is, is elevating and honoring the, this, the, the apple in this poem. But I also think he's kind of playing. He's kind of playing with the diction, right? Um, you might start a poem with that O, you know, there's no H in the O, with the O, right? It's, it's a very poetic um, O, um, a very romantic, po po romantic in terms of romantic poetry, that O, O lovely apple with that exclamation point. I, so I think that when we continue down our path of kind of understanding and reading through the poem, I think it might be okay to sort of go like, are you for real with that oh lovely apple stuff? Because it's very surprising. So I think he's sort of playing with the diction, right? This high diction, but you'll notice the high diction, oh lovely apple. He's not saying, oh lovely apple on a spring. Uh, oh, well, I guess when would, when would an apple be the most ripe? in the early, early fall, late summer. Oh, lovely apple, fleshy and, um, you know, sitting uh, on the picnic, you know, table and so, so, you know, just sort of painting this really glorious scene where we can elevate the apple. There's a lot of surprises in the poem 
Some of those have to do with that diction. And some of them just have to do with the way he um, places, where he places words, like the syntax of the poem and how you come to it. So not to get too far ahead of myself, but just in terms of orientation, those are some of the first things I probably would notice in the poem the first time I'm seeing it. I would probably, and I did, I've been reading this poem uh, myself. I've been reading this poem for, I mean, I probably read this poem when I was in college. So I've been reading this poem for at least 20 years. And I, until I was preparing for this, you know, earlier this morning and just wanting to make sure, I looked up the pronunciation of the word suffusing. And I have for 20 years been pronouncing that word suffusing. It's not suffusing, it's pronounced suffusing. Um, and so even there, it, I might understand what the word means, suffuse, suffusing. It's gonna take me a little while to adjust that. I didn't even know how to pronounce that word. And I've been reading and, write, and reading and teaching this poem for many, many years. So, you know, this might be a time also when you go like, okay, I don't know what, I don't know what suffusing means. Let me look it up. Or I don't know how to pronounce that word. Let me look it up. Um, I would also note that, oh, lovely apple, that elevated, oh, lovely apple is in the middle. There's an exclamation point in the middle of that sentence. Oh, lovely apple, beautifully and completely rotten, comma, right? So that's also something that he's playing with. There's a there's an exclamation point in the middle of a sentence. We don't usually see that. We know that it's in the middle of the sentence because grammatically it falls in the middle of the sentence, but also he gives us a clue because beautifully is not capitalized. So we see that it's in the middle of a sentence. So I would make sure that I understand the sentences here. Oh, lovely apple, beautifully and completely rotten, hardly a contour marred. Right, hardly a contour marred. Marred is means um, um, messed up, right? Uh, scarred, marred, marked. So beautifully and completely rotten. That's that word. We're going to come back to that word, but it's a real surprise when it comes because what follows it hardly a contour marred. Perhaps a little shriveled at the top, but that aside, perfect in every detail. And I don't know that in my, I'm sure that in, at some point in my life, I have seen an apple um, that looks like this. An apple that is, that has been, has been sitting somewhere so long and hasn't been, you know, not in a fruit bowl being smushed by other fruit, but just sitting and able to kind of rot in place. And the way an apple can look like that what a deep and suffusing brown mantles that unspoiled surface. So if you've ever seen an apple that looks like that, it's like the red has sort of drained out of it a little bit, but the brown that is, that is, uh, that the brown is very, like it's can be very shiny. And again, hardly a contour marred, maybe a little shriveled at the top, right? Where the stem is. But that aside, perfect in every detail. What a deep and suffusing, so we say, oh, lovely apple again. And then what a deep and suffusing brown mantles that unspoiled surface. It's the second time he's mentioned the surface of the apple. So he means it. That's, that's, he's describing it so well, he's, just, he's saying it twice. So that is the description of the apple there. And then there's the turn at the end, that last sentence. If this poem ended with what a deep and suffusing brown mantles that unspoiled surface, that would be one poem. It would be, a, it would be a, an interesting poem, a, 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 an interesting celebration of a rotten apple. You don't see that every day, but he, that's not what happens. He adds this other narrative detail, right? No one has moved you since I placed you on the porch rail a month ago to ripen, right? And so you now you understand the whole history of this poem. And in that last sentence, there's something about it that not only do, do you get that gong of like recognition of what, he, what he's saying, that he placed, he placed this 
when it was perfectly, or when it was not ripe, it was not yet ripe, he placed it on the porch rail a month ago to ripen. And then he's forgotten about it, right? The speaker has forgotten about the poem and no one has moved it. He placed it on the porch rail a month ago to ripen. And here he's come back to it and he's looking at it and it's completely rotten, but looks kind of perfect in its own way. Um, and I think there's some, you know, even that narrative detail is enough but when you start thinking about that and thinking about the strange ways that um, we, the strange ways we mark time passing, right, in our lives, and the ways that sometimes some things that can feel really important in the moment, I want to eat this apple, but it's not ripe yet. I'm going to place it deliberately on this porch trail to ripen. And then, we, you know, he's forgotten about it. So his memory is sort of jogged. And what comes out of his memory being jogged when he sees this apple rotten on the porch uh, rail where he placed it a month ago is this sort of meditation, this lyric meditation on a rotten apple. And so there are so many surprises in the poem. And I think when you're reading it to perform it, having a sense of where the poet is, is placing those surprises can really inform your understanding of the poem and um, kind of, like I said, kind of like internalizing it in your body so that you, so that you know it very well. Um, and sometimes when you internalize something and you know them very well, you don't feel so much pressure to perform them, you know, for an audience. You know it in your, you know it in your mind and in your body and just saying it is going to be um, enough for the, your audience to comprehend and understand along with you the surprises in the poem um, and the meanings in the poem. So, um, so again, I would say we, we, we start with these, oh, lovely apples. And by the time we've read this poem a few times, it does seem like he's playing a little bit with diction there. Um, it's, it's maybe beside the point of this to mention, but William Carlos Williams was a poet who was writing after the Romantic poets, right? Where ode on a Grecian urn, ode to spring, these poems that would just be endless kind of lyrical high diction, um, you know, the if very formal uh, poems that were like, you know, they were elevated to a degree that William Carlos Williams wanted to bring down to earth. And he really was one of the, the, the um, first poets in America uh, to write like this to write in, in a, a kind of free verse and to um, write very clear images. In fact, he said um, something very famously, he said in a poem that he, he, he didn't ever say it elsewhere, but it came to signify the whole poetic movement that William Carlos Williams, they're called the imagists and they were part of the, the modernism movement in poetry. He said, no ideas, but in things, right? So he's talking about the difference between abstraction, right? Oh, perfection of the utmost consequences that, right, that, that high diction, high abstraction, romantic poetry. He's saying, no, bring it down to earth. No ideas, no abstractions, but in things, but in images, right? No ideas, but in things, right? So even in the title there, you see that he's playing with that notion, perfection a huge abstraction as a title against this poem, which is completely um, uh, following the rule that he sets forth in, in the line in his poem, um, no ideas but in things. Um, so knowing that, you, I think when you know that and you enter the poem, and you think about how much William Carlos Williams is investing in the images in the poem, 
fully and entirely. William Carlos Williams, of course, was the poet also who wrote, read, uh, wrote the poem, So Much Depends Upon the Red Wheelbarrow, right? That very short, very imagistic poem. So I think understanding a little bit about what William Carlos Williams thinks about things rather than ideas makes it so much more appealing to enter this poem because what he's doing is he's creating a thing, right? We talked about perfection. I said it was like floating in the sky. It's like in the, in the space, right? What he does is he takes that and he pins it to the, it's, it's you, the, the image in my mind's eye when I, by the time I get to the last line of this poem is so utterly clear. I mean, it's one of the most remarkable things about reading, right? I have an image in my mind. You have a completely di different image in your mind. We've, we've traveled the same path together. So just kind of understanding um, that the clarity of the images is so important to William Carlos Williams um, and that he relies so heavily on them in the poem. And that I think re uh, uh, reciting the poem, um, having a clear sense of that, um, is a good way of traveling through the poem. Um, and then thinking about, again, perfection. Perfection. Oh, lovely apple. Beautifully and completely rotten. Right? Do you see that turn there? I'm already going like, oh, here we go. Oh, lovely apple. Beautifully and completely rotten. There's a surprise right there in the third line of the poem. Wait, what? I'm sorry, the perfection, the, the, the lovely apple is rotten? Like who could, turn, who, could, who could turn away from this poem at that point? Like you, you just have to continue. Perfection, oh lovely apple, beautifully and completely rotten. Hardly a contour marred, perhaps a little shriveled at the top, but that aside, perfect in every detail. Oh, lovely apple, what a deep and suffusing brown mantles that unspoiled surface. He's painting this tremendously clear picture in our minds. And then another surprise, another turn. No one has moved you since I placed you on the porch rail a month ago to ripen. Um, thinking about how uh, William Carlos Williams is, um, uh, is leaving us at the end of this poem with only image and narrative. He doesn't go on to say, as uh, Pablo Neruda does at the end of some of his odes, the moral of my ode is this. He doesn't say that. He doesn't explain beyond that. All we have at the end of this poem and all we need at the end of this poem is that really clear image, narrative image, narrative detail at the end of the poem. No one has moved you since I placed you on the porch rail a month ago to ripen. I think um, uh, keeping in mind the way that he's playing with diction, oh, lovely apple, completely rotten, um, the high and the low, here, thinking about how he is surprising us throughout the poem, beautifully and completely rotten. How he's using images, such clear images, to paint a picture in our minds of this apple, this particular apple that has been sitting on the porch trail a month ago, where he placed it to ripen. Thinking about those things as you enter the poem, to me, is a really great way of making sure that you have the poem completely inside your, your body. Because this is a poem I think that I, I really love thinking about talk, uh, thinking about performing this poem. Because I think that unless you kind of internalize the poem and have it, and you know the surprises, it's like telling a joke. You know the like joy in telling a joke where you, you know, playing along and then you give the punchline and it's like, ha. Huh. It's like you want to keep all those secrets and surprise, these secret surprises inside of you so that when you perform it, they come out as, the, as, as clearly as they were meant to come out rather than uh, overly performing, 
this poem because I do think that overly performing this poem would completely, um, uh, it would be very jarring um, uh, because I don't, I don't know necessarily that this poem um, um, desires a reading. Um, that way. So in some ways, I think that this is this is a, a bit of a, a, a challenging poem to would, that would it would be a challenging poem to recite um, because it's doing a lot of things with the language, but in the end, it's a very quiet poem, right? And how it, um, it's a very quiet poem with a million implications at the end, but still, how do you you know sort of um, give that over to your audience? And to me, it seems like the more you can enjoy and appreciate and understand. For yourself, the poem, the easier that is to uh, perform. And I see that I've gone six minutes over my time, and I'm very sorry. <laughs> no, you're absolutely fine. Um, I, you know, I think it's really interesting what you said about the uh, learning the pronunciation of the word suffusing, because as I heard you read it this last time, I hear the word oozing in there, you know, as you're talking about this as an oozing brown, you know, it's suffusing brown, but it's also, it, it, it plays on multiple levels there when, when that Absolutely. Comes up. And even like playing with that, that um, echo of the word oozing is still, it, it really is so much better than suffusing suffusing it has that sense of oozing in it right ooze, <laughs> yeah. to ooze is like an onomatopoeic poet, poetic word right right yeah yeah well that's fantastic thank you so much for doing this today carrie oh it was my pleasure go texas oh. go team texas <laughs> And thank you for watching this video. We hope you will watch the rest of the videos in this series. If you or your school are interested in participating in the next Poetry Out Loud competition, please contact us at poetryoutloud at arts.texas.gov. Have a great day.